Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Where we're going to be looking at the sectors um, and also at some of the capital flows and picking up some of the points around that. Um, but let's let's just start first of all, maybe Douglas, and, and give a quick introduction as we do with this. Um, but just from your point of view, I, I guess. How are you seeing some of the, the key changes um, in the market and what are you seeing as we move towards 2021? Well, when we're focusing on the uh, CEE in particular for us, it's Poland, as you are aware. We're very much looking at the PBSA or the student accommodation and residential market uh, in Poland. And what we're seeing is increased interest in the sector from a number of parties but we're looking more on the value add uh, area of capital inflows into Poland for this area and the developments related to it. We're seeing some fun with the domestic banks and I look forward to hearing Justina's comments later in terms of the banking market in Poland. I have to say though, give credit to a number of the local players, they are being very supportive. But I would say that we see Poland as a natural extension of our business, core state being a pan-European uh, investment management manager. And I think for us, as I mentioned, PBSA, student accommodation is where we see ourselves in the CEE. Super. Great. Thanks very much. Um, Craig, j just picking up with you, a lot of changes, obviously, over this year across the world. Um, but what are you seeing in terms of South African capital? Um, because South African capital obviously been very active before in CEE. Yeah. So maybe just to, to kind of frame the context, um, we obviously provide research to our clients on the listed property sector in, in South Africa. So those, some of those investors are, have been very active in, in the CE region over the last sort of five to 10 years. Um, I think the reality is, um, you know, South Africa's obviously, uh, you know, had a, had a tough time as many emerging markets and developed markets have had through, um, through this pandemic and, and sort of subsequent lockdowns that we've experienced in, in South Africa, um, and I think that's ultimately placed pressure on, um, you know, balance sheets of, of, of REIT. So I think, you know, the focus for the, for the foreseeable future is going to be around repairing and strengthening balance sheets. Um, so I think the, the, the appetite to expand is going to be constrained by, um, you know, the, the realities around um, additional headroom to um, you know, to fulfill those um, sort of those sort of um, ambitions. Um, I think also, uh, you know, I think we we at a at a stage now where it's not yet clear in terms of how various sectors sort of um, emerge from from the pandemic. So I think that's that's something that um, will be watched sort of closely over the over you know the next sort of six to twelve months. Okay, good. And I know Richard's got some other questions to, to pick up on. Um, but, but Herman, just coming to you, obviously, um, you know, again, pan-European investor, different types of capital. Um, how are you seeing the CE from a, from a capital perspective point of view? Um, you know, what's the capital saying to you? How do you see CE, particularly as a region, in comparison to the other areas that... Uh, that Mark is investing in? We have been uh, rebranded as Mark uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, basically emphasizing our role as, as, as platform for manager of plat several investment platforms and also emphasizing our role as, uh, let's say, through active uh, management to improve, let's say, urban mixed use landmark properties in, in core cities. As Maya Bergman, of course, we have had quite a long history in, in Central Europe, I would say mainly in retail and in shopping centers, although I have to admit that as Mark, our, our retail investment uh, component uh, has been drastically reduced more into urban mixed use and last mile logistics. Well, we are, of course, dealing with, with, with a wide range of international investors participating uh, in, our, uh, in our investment platforms. And, um, well, key things we hear about Central Europe, to be honest, uh, Central Europe in our current strategy is not really our, one of our prime uh, expansion areas. Um, although, you know, with, with the investors, we see obviously uh, the potential for growth. We see the potential of unsaturated demand. We see also the, the potential of, of, let's say, rapid investment growth. Obviously, uh, one of the concerns, I would say, maybe a little bit more on the transparency side, at least that's what we hear from investors whom we are in contact. Looking, of course, to Central Europe, I would say, where are we interested? Where do we have a potential view? 
that's definitely Czech Republic and of course Poland as Poland is largest market uh, having volume having a fast growth having escaped so far most of the economic particularly the global financial crisis and I would say particularly on the side also of logistics obviously there is an enormous uh, untapped potential in terms of international trade and also growing consumption and linked to that uh, online retail sales uh, as well. Sure, I mean, actually, it's kind of the same question um, that we've been asking even in the first panel, but with a different group of panelists. Um, so if we can continue, um, Jean Bernard, um, from your perspective, what has changed over the last seven, eight months? And what are the new risks from your um, perspective obviously risk is your main if you can also obviously introduce yourself and your company briefly um, okay. Many people know it but just to refresh what are the main risks go, the new risks going forward good question no no uh, so we are now part of AXA Excel we used to be secure legal title and we ensure legal risks in all, all over Europe so in real estate transaction in M&A transactions so yes uh, for AXA itself, of course, COVID had a major impact, especially in the area of the canceled events and things like that. For us, on the title side, there were some new elements of risks. Uh, one certainly was the fact that in, it wasn't the case in major cities, but in smaller districts in Poland, all of a sudden we found that the uh, land and mortgage registries were closed because you might have had one employee, that employee was off either sick or on home leave. So all of a sudden we could not uh, process requests that we were getting and that has blocked certain transactions. What we also see is when we ensure the uh, loss of revenue, uh, if that loss of revenue for the, uh, for the buyer, for, if we get to ensure title on a property and then together with that we ensure the loss of rent, if something should happen to title, it is clear that if the loss of rent is extended because the courts cannot stay in session or have to suspend their session by a few months, that adds to the risk. And it's certainly something that uh, we need to take into consideration. Other than that, in terms of what has changed, we've certainly seen a drop of transaction April, May, deals that were canceled, postponed. But most of it came back later in the summer, and now we have been extremely active. It doesn't seem that the second wave of COVID has at all affected the number of transactions or the volume of activity that we have. So that was sort of interesting. And uh, yeah, in terms of new risk directly related to the situ actual situation, that's what we've been seeing. That's, that's a really interesting point, Jean Bedard. And I, I wanted to pick up with Justina, just in terms of the... Um, I suppose, looking from the financing side, you're having to assess those risks, where the opportunities are, what's happening in the market. Um, so I suppose, how are you seeing it from a financing point of view? Um, I suppose, where do you see where we are now in terms of the market? And, and how do you see, um, I guess, it going forward into 2021? I'm Justyna Kędzierska and I'm heading the Warsaw office of Berlin Hub. Berlin Hub is a German bank specialized in real estate finance. Uh, so, from our perspective, um, in fact, the perception of the market segments did not change a lot, I must admit. I mean, like, for example, retail. Retail has become a point of, well, maybe not concern, by, but uh, considerations uh, of, of banks and other market players al already uh, some time ago. Uh, and of course, it was connected to the to what we have observed, to the trends which we have observed in the Western Europe. Uh, the trends um, showing that the that the retail concept uh, is a bit changing right now. Uh, of course, following the other other uh, changes in market trends, in the expectations of people. So retail has not been for us, well, the main point of our business, in fact. Um, of course, uh, we fully appreciate the, the, the function of retail, and I'm sure there will be retail concepts that, that, will, be, uh, that will be resistant to some, well, let's say, shorter-term shocks uh, in the market. Uh, yeah, so this was like a kind of a confirmation of, well, maybe an acceleration of the trends as it was, it was described in the previous panel. 
uh, which, which were there in the market independently of, of, of the COVID. Uh, hotels, uh, in, in case of Berlin Hub, were never the main focus. Hotel, hotel financing account may be like for, I don't know, 3% of our total portfolio, uh, which proves, of course, that we, uh, even before the pandemic, were uh, looking at hotels on a very selective basis. Uh, as for the whole, uh, well, the general situation, let's say, well, we still believe that uh, in the real estate markets, independently of these short-term shocks and uncertainties uh, there, uh, there will be pro products which will be able always to defend their position on a long-term basis. And this is, so again, case-by-case -case approach. Uh, looking at the fundamentals of the market, of the, of the product itself. Okay, good. Um, and Samuel, I mean, one of the interesting things that's, that's appeared in a lot of the discussions that we've been doing, but is, is that kind of focus on some of the more, what would have been considered alternative assets or more niche assets, and, and Douglas also mentioned that already. Um, but I suppose, Samuel, what are you seeing in terms of the student housing markets, the senior living markets, those kinds of areas? Are they proving more resilient? And I suppose, what's, what are you seeing as the outlook? I see, in comparison to uh, other regions of Europe or the world, has been performing uh, slightly better than the other regions. Um, the occupancies have been hit by about 10%, which is a good news. Uh, it's, it's better than hotel. Or, or office, um, and 10% uh, lower occupancies in COVID times, it's actually relatively uh, resilient. Um, the investors' uh, demand actually increased by about, to our knowledge, about 30%. So, uh, especially uh, Poland, Prague, uh, Budapest, um, and tier two cities in Austria, if we count Austria as a CE. And uh, uh, we also see that uh, the banks are not necessarily less interested or in doubt, but the LTVs adjusted by about 5%. Um, so uh, banks are a bit more cautious. And uh, uh, what uh, they, the demand for information also is probably stronger. Uh, uh, we have been having more work in CE than ever, I have to say as a research firm and uh, observing about 30 different opportunities and assessing them. Uh, so uh, there is Samuel, a lot. Can I, can I interrupt? What kind of requests for research are you getting from your clients? What are they asking? It depends on the type of investor. If it is an institutional investor, they, they go uh, top down. So country report first, then uh, city reports, then uh, district assessment and then asset assessment. Uh, so valuation calculations, financial analysis, uh, forecasting. Uh, we do a lot of mystery shopping across the properties in the region to see how the occupancies are at the beginning of the semester and now uh, with the second wave uh, arriving. Uh, so uh, uh, it's either the general uh, fundamental metrics uh, on a macro and micro level or it's performance uh, data uh, that tells uh, about where we are now and uh, or forecasting data. Uh, like, especially Poland has been a great market for these asset class of student housing and co-living because as one of the few European countries, Poland offers scale. So you can build a portfolio. And um, uh, therefore, we see a lot of uh, investment interest uh, these days. Uh, especially a, a new interest from uh, overseas capital uh, because that's, uh, that's the provenience of a capital that is looking for scale. Uh, what we actually uh, don't see are the opportunities, so new opportunities, especially in tier two cities across uh, Poland. Uh, we see a lot of demand for Prague, but we all know that Prague is difficult uh, because of uh, zoning and planning. Uh, you need uh, over 70 stamps to get approval. So much more, you know, looking at the conversion. So uh, uh, some, some buildings that are there. So uh, we actively seeking for opportunities in Prague. 
Um, and uh, Budapest is pretty much the same. Uh, so uh, that's uh, also of, of a demand over there. And people want to expand in Austria. So Vienna is reaching its saturation. Not there yet, but slightly uh, reaching the, 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 the roof uh, for uh, saturation if all the pipeline is completed. So now there is a seek for tier, tier two cities. Uh, yeah. So in general, uh, CE is at the sort of uh, beginning of this asset class development. Uh, I mean, calling in student housing more resilient as at other uh, regions. Uh, we also saw this in uh, GFC in 2009, that this, this region was more resilient. Uh, when it comes to senior housing, as uh, Richard said at the beginning, well, this, this asset class is in a very early stage, uh, even though the demand is very strong, but uh, we, we see only the initial demand for, for, for the asset class. So it's nothing to compare it with pre-COVID, I would say. Douglas, obviously you mentioned there um, student housing, micro-living, um, and I know that you've been active recently um, in Poland, Gdansk. Um, I suppose, what are you seeing? What are the key drivers for you? What's, I mean, what's attractive for that? And do you see that that can also potentially be replicated elsewhere within the region? Or is this really, is, is Poland a starting point for you? Or do you see Poland as where you're going to stay? I think the first thing I would mention is Poland clearly is the country, but we're city driven, uh, city driven across our PBSA, whether we're in Poland and Germany or Spain or wherever. And Poland has got some very dynamic and developing cities and you know, the Downs, Rakov, and also in, in Warsaw, where we're looking to do our next transaction. Um, but for, for us, it's very simple. And Sami will tell you, you know, you've got 1.3 million students in, in Poland. You've got a very poor provision, just 9% provision for accommodation. Most of that is in the public sector. Uh, the land costs are very attractive relative to greenfield development. Uh, so for us, the dynamics are interesting. The area which we're seeing uh, some challenges, clearly, as I mentioned earlier, is the banking community. Whilst the international banks who support us elsewhere are following us in, the domestic banks have balance sheet issues. And we're seeing them pushing some of their clients to exiting uh, unnecessary land plots, which has given us as an international investor opportunities. I think the more important thing in Poland is getting the operating platform right. Uh, because Poland doesn't have a natural operating platform, at least in the PBSA sector. So that's where not only we come in with capital from a development viewpoint with partners, but it's the operating platform. So that's just PBSA. But I would have to say, talking to the, my executive board, we see Poland more than just one sector, albeit we, we go with PBSA. We think Poland will have a wider appetite from a German market perspective. We've already seen a number of German institutions come in, in the office sector in particular. And I think that will continue post-COVID once our colleagues here in Germany um, get their ICs looking at the markets again in 2021. But I'm very comfortable with the medium to long-term dynamics, at least in our core sector in Poland, the PBSA sector. And I concur with Samuel, the uh, assisted living or senior housing, which we think will come. Uh, it's a little bit in its infancy at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, this is a general question for each panelist and to, to hear What's on your mind at the moment? What, uh, let's say from positive and negative, what, what are you worried about? And what are you positive about? And I also want to slip into that, you know, that um, end users are the, you know, driver of any sector. So in your sector, do you see, obviously, you know, uncertain times, but then um, the vaccination talk and everything, do you see this year, next year as a blip and everything moves on smoothly? Or do you think there's fundamental change on what, is that change? So quite a big question. Justina, over to you. What's on your mind in a positive and negative way? <laughs> Uh, well, I will start with, with, with the negative uh, aspects, maybe. I think that, um, of course, everyone is, is, um, is looking to, to at the situation, how the situation will develop. I mean, uh, how much the uh, companies will be affected by the crisis. Uh, the banks are, are also getting prepared, let's say, for worst case scenario, uh, covering kind of bigger wave of insolvencies and so on. This is 
particularly important in case of the universal uh, banks uh, who have their exposure in this corporate segment as well, uh, independently of their uh, of their of their exposure in the hotel sectors um, itself. But we know that the problems of the of the hotels and other entities. Uh, affected by the by the pandemic will, will of course influence a chain of their providers, their their business partners, and so on. So I think the, this is one of the biggest question marks: how deep will this will this uh, will this go? Uh, nevertheless, independently of uh, of let's say our of looking carefully at the development of the situation. Uh, we, of course, um, again, we do believe that the uh, right product in right location will always defend its position. So we do not see here any, any, any big points like to worry about the quality of the portfolio. It's first of all to think about the adequate strategy for this short term turbulences in the market for this uncertainty period. And of course, well, from my personal perspective, well, uh, I'm still very positive about Poland. Uh, I think that with all the aspects that were already elaborated a bit uh, earlier today, uh, like first of all, the market size, uh, the, the fundamentals of the economy, uh, will help us to, um, to again, to see uh, a nice recovery very soon. Thank you. Um, you said, Her Herman, from your perspective, what, what's on your mind? What are you positive about? What are you worried about? Well, I mean, of, of, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the whole COVID impact so far, of course, it's a massive hurricane impacting uh, society, impacting the economy. But, you know, looking to a few parameters, I think so far what we have seen with the handling uh, and you compare it, for instance, with the global financial crisis, I think the, the, the central banks act, acted more fast and they acted faster. I think the reaction was better coordinated. When you look also at the governments, I think an advantage when you look across Europe, across the world, of course, dependent on financial possibilities, I think the governments have been better able and willing to, uh, you know, from a fiscal point of view, to, uh, to counterbalance the impact of COVID. And of course, also looking to the real estate market, again, very generalized. If you look at the point of view, you know, in terms of supply and demand, in terms of development activity, I think the market is, is, is more balanced than it was at the start of the global financial crisis. So although, of course, 2020, from an economic point of view, is a very difficult year. I can imagine if, let's say, the vaccination is going to work. We end up in a kind of new normality that actually uh, the recovery may be, you know, maybe delayed, but may also maybe, let's say, relatively smooth also in the market. Obviously, what keeps us busy, uh, and I think in that sense, it's very interesting to, to, to see what happened, you know, the panic of the first lockdown. And let's say the more tailored second lockdown, also the, the calmer reaction on it. Obviously, how is the new normal going to look like? And how will the new normal uh, impact the way we shop, uh, the way we work, the way we live, and the way we travel? And so obviously, that will impact, of course, also the need for real estate. And I think, you know, also from a strategic point of view, you know, it has already been said by Douglas, uh, we are basically also in our investment strategy very much focused on large cities, core cities, also core assets within those cities. But obviously, how is that going to impact portfolios? How is it going to impact uh, repositioning, repurposing? Obviously, if, let's say, we, we do things well, and also the, econo the economic normalization goes, let's say, relatively smooth. Obviously, that will give, of course, issues for many players, but I think it will also give, uh, give possibilities. So in that sense, I would say uh, uh, we are looking forward to the new normal and how that's going to impact and play with the real estate and how we are going to adapt to that. Thank you. Craig, over to you. Um, from your perspective, coming from South Africa, um, looking at Central Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe, what's what's what are you worried about, and what's positive? I would um, suggest is is positive is I think looking at um, you know certainly to the US and the election cycle and the way that that's sort of panning out. Um, I think there's sort of broad consensus that 
from an emerging market. Um, and again, I know Poland specifically is no longer uh, sort of classified as an emerging market, but I still think from, you know, from the perspective of, of certain developed market investors, it may still be seen to be sort of emerging um, into, into that developed market space. So I would say that bodes well, um, I, would, I would suggest, for, for emerging markets. Um, I think also given what's playing out you know, with, with a lot of governments having to take on board significantly more debt to obviously, um, you know, to, to you know, absorb the, the shocks and, and get through this crisis. I think that, to my mind, and, and again, it, it seems to be the broad consensus, is that rates globally um, are, are going to be lower for longer. Um, so I think for a market like, like Poland, um, you know, there's, a, there's an argument to make that the yield spread or you know, yields are, are likely to be attractive for, for international investors. Um, from a, from a, you know, what, what concerns me, and it's maybe not, um, you know, Poland-specific concern, but I do think, you know, touching on what, what Herman, um, you know, mentioned around the way, you know, things are, are likely to look, um, you know, in, in the next sort of six to 12 months and, and the impact that has for, um, for various real estate um, classes from retail to offices. I think, um, you know, you know, just, just touching on offices, I, I, I probably sit in the camp where I think, you know, the, 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 the trend and the move to maybe not remote working fully, but, but flexible working and the impact that has on, um, you know, overall sort of office demand or the type of, the type of, type of office space that, that occupiers require, um, I think that's sort of something which becomes a bit more difficult to underwrite. Um, you know, and the you know the typical model of of real estate sign, you know, landlord signing long term long term leases with with corporate occupiers. I think coming out of this out of this crisis, I, I do see um, you know that dynamic dynamic potentially potentially changing. Um, so so those would be some of the some of the you know items that I was flag, I would flag as a, a you know something that I think it's still very much un, unknown and depending on which side of the you know debate you sit you know the views are quite quite divergent still. Well, yep. same question to Jean Bernard, but uh, yeah. Yes, positive. It's, I'm very surprised that we have maintained that level of activity. I think our activity is even up in Poland. We've certainly seen twenty percent more transaction. There has been a shift. We see much more warehouses and uh, also residential than we used to and perhaps fewer offices but uh, that's still surprised i was expecting much worse we don't live in a bubble and i was expecting that yes the economy would slow down and real estate would and it doesn't seem to have been the case so uh, as i said that came can you, uh, um, Jean Bernard, can you define activity i know this may be an obvious question but for you when you say activity is much better than you expected what, what do you mean exactly by activity? Well, the number of transactions that we insure, the number of deals, that, the deal flow that we see. And so investment deals, yeah? Investment, it's purely investment. It's some refinancing with banks, that's true. But it's mostly uh, volume of transactions, the deals, the number of files, the number of deals that we underwrite is way up. I mean, even in uh, Romania, where it was an extremely slow year, all of a sudden, there's, I wouldn't say a flurry, but we are deal, doing our largest deal, uh, insuring the largest deal ever in Romania. So even in a market that was certainly distressed early in the year, things seem to be picking up. So that was a source, I wouldn't say optimism, I would say a pleasant surprise. Uh, in terms of concern, I'm just repeating what other people may have said, that uh, I still think we haven't seen the end of it. I still think that the long-term consequences on the retail, on small uh, shops, on uh, high street, on people having have restaurants and, and shops, we haven't seen the impact yet, and that has to be felt. Uh, and what about uh, the type of investor? What about it? you say the oh, type of investor has that changed? Well, what is it? Yes, it has. We've seen certainly a flow from investor from Asia now, and what is also interesting is that we've been involved uh, more in uh, local deals like. A Pol Polish investor buying Polish properties much more than in the past. So that was also interesting local transactions where we usually were not that involved. But, you know, so that's a shift. 
I think that's really interesting that um, that switch there that you mentioned, Jean Bernard, to um, more domestic capital, more Polish investors and Polish deals, because that's something we've been tracking actually in the CE yeah. summit over the past few years. And I think also picks up the point from the minister earlier and uh, that, that created some interest I noticed on LinkedIn around the ability to bring REITs back in, you know, to bring re that REIT discussion forward into the market. Um, Justina, I just wanted to quickly pick up on, on the point that, that Douglas mentioned, um, but didn't actually ask. And so I will ask it for him, which was around the no, sort of financing side, um, particularly, I guess, Douglas, if I'm right on uh, development and PBSA. Um, what's what's the position there? Because um, these are smaller sectors. It's it's not the, your traditional office. Um, mm -hmm. So how easy is it to get those things, you know, these kinds of deals that Douglas is looking for financed? Well, it's not easy. <laughs> I must agree with Douglas. It's, uh, I think the reason for it uh, is, of course, that these are uh, new markets, uh, new real estate markets, new segments, where, first of all, from a perspective of a foreign uh, bank, like, for example, Berlin Hub, uh, we first of all need to see some track record of this market. We need to understand uh, how the, this market uh, works in Poland. These are, these are uh, quite specific segments of the market, very much uh, connect, very closely connected with the local specifics, let's, let's say. So from our point of view, it's not... Uh, it's just too early for us to be in this segment, but uh, I admit we are we are we are watching the development of this market very closely. Um, so the answer would be that of course the best uh, best uh, contact partners for this type of product right now on the financing side would be the um, the local banks who have the uh, a better understanding of the local needs who maybe have some more expertise. Uh, internally, like um, you know, to be able to uh, verify what's uh, what kind of demand there is in the market, what what are the let's say uh, best and worst case scenarios for the development of this segment. I also think that that sooner or later, because anyway, the the banks they are following their clients. They, so the more investors there are in this segment, the more investment transaction we see the more uh, the more uh, well liquid the market on the financing side for this kind of uh, assets will become samuel is uh, justina there mentions obviously that there's a there's there's an issue certainly in terms of the the kind of cross border financing the banks um, how much of a block is that on um, i suppose the growth of but certainly the student housing and therefore also the, the senior living side um, in CE. I will perhaps take it also from the context of uh, the previous question that uh, other Richard asked. Uh, what, what's, what, are, what is our view on the future? And also what Douglas mentioned. Um, uh, in general, it seems like the, the CE region is coming closer to the rented residential asset classes in general, be it uh, investors, developers, or banks. Uh, and what I'm not necessarily uh, afraid of is the, the scale there, demand. There are always uh, more students in and after uh, down economic downturns. Also, we see a lot of propensity to uh, structured accommodation. In Poland, when we did the research, 95% of uh, students and young professionals don't want to share room, so uh, they want individual rooms. Uh, so they will be moving from shared flats to a product like uh, PBSA. So demand is not uh, of a concern, uh, neither is capital that much. Uh, that, that seems to be uh, abundant for, for this type of market. Yield spread is also good. Um, we anticipated uh, the, the exit deal will be going down, so 200 uh, BIP spread will be achievable at, at this market. What I'm concerned is really banking. Um, and uh, I slightly disagree with you, Stina, I have to say, uh, because we have experienced this in Netherlands in 2014. We have experienced this in Spain 15, 16, that when new asset class is coming uh, to, uh, to the market, the local banks are 
let me call it politely, not an early adapters, uh, but rather they, they don't understand the asset class. They need to be educated. And for example, like uh, in Austria, you know, in, uh, in Vienna, one, once Erste and others uh, understood the asset class, then they are comfortable and then speed up the progress of, uh, of the asset class. We see Santander uh, in Poland, that's probably one of the strongest uh, banking house in the world for this asset class. So uh, uh, they probably don't need so much uh, education and uh, confidence because they have experience from other territories. But I think it either needs an international banks to step in with their experience uh, and confidence in this asset class they provide LTVs 30, 70 in mature uh, countries. In Poland now, to my knowledge, it's somewhere around 40 to 60, 45 to 55 uh, in COVID. So um, uh, if, if they are more educated and if they are more experienced, it will be faster adoption of, of this asset class. So yes, local expertise and experience is important, like Justina is saying, but I think that uh, without the international uh, knowledge and experience, the banks will be too cautious. Uh, you know, when we talk into banks, they have a question like, what's the leverage and what's, uh, uh, what's the percentage of pre-lease for student housing and clothing? Well, none, you know, that's, that's not, uh, not, not an, uh, it's not like an office or resi to sell that you need to have a 30% or 60% pre-lease. On the other hand, you know, occupancies in these asset class are 98%. 97% and the, the professional operators are able to start filling the properties 12 months before completion. And there is a track record of 7,000 buildings in the world that uh, if the product is right, then uh, the occupancies are always about 95%. Um, so the assurance and risk mitigation is coming from somewhere else than, than, than pre-lease. But local banks, uh, uh, might not necessarily have this experience and they need to, to, to learn it from somewhere. So international houses uh, like Erste, IPAS and Santander, uh, Unicredit and others might be also sort of uh, uh, good houses to combine the local and international experience. What I'm a little bit uh, also, uh, especially uh, in Poland, afraid is to get the product right. Probably Douglas can fill in all, over here. But there is a little bit of a rush in Poland now to step into student housing and, uh, and co-living. Uh, and um, in this, this, this rush, there might be mistakes, you know, and if the, if the product is not right, if the rental levels are not right, it will take three to five years to correct the market to the right levels of, uh, of rental, uh, rental rents and, uh, and product. Um, and we have seen already mistakes in Poland. There are some products that uh, are not good, neither by rental levels, nor by occupancies, nor type of a product. So uh, I think that uh, it's, it's really important that the product uh, and price is right. Interesting. Good. Thank you. Um, Jean-Bernard, I promise to come back to you with this question. Um, thank you, Dorota, for your, for your question. Um, uh, do you differentiate countries from risk perspective, Romania versus Poland, uh, or are your title policies generally for the CE? We certainly don't uh, look at political risks. So yes, uh, we're not covering political risks, but uh, we do differentiate definitely between countries. And there are some countries where the rule of law uh, appears very safe and unchallenged. Uh, there are some countries where the rule of law, like Bulgaria, can be very questionable. So that leads us to uh, look at it differently. And there are some countries in between. So yes, uh, we, we're sensitive to what is the, it's mostly the rule of law. I mean, if there are some challenges to the independence of the judiciary, that's a big deal for us. And yes, we've seen that in some countries. And it's not an evolution that we like or that we, uh, yes, that we feel comfortable with. Craig, I just wanted to pick up with you um, just quickly in terms of the South African capital, um, because of the situation there locally, do you, are you expecting some of the REITs to be selling off? And, and does that mean that there may be more opportunities, you know, that's going to bring some more sellers into the market? What's your sense of that? Look, I, I don't think it's a, um, I think maybe just to, just to look at the type of capital that's invested in 
in C from an SA perspective. Um, you know, it's typically through listed, um, you know, property companies, which are REIT-like, so permanent capital, um, permanent capital vehicles, so the likes of EPP and Nepi Rock Castle, um, you know, and again, they're in slightly different positions from a, from a capital structure point of view and a balance sheet structure, and their businesses are slightly different in, the one, in that the one is pan Central and Eastern Europe, another one is just purely focused on, on retail in, in Poland. So I think, you know, the decision would be very much driven by, um, you know, one's capital structure. So again, um, you know, the situation is quite different between those two, two big investors in the broader region. Um, I think that the point I'd rather highlight is that, um, you know, whether, whether or not, you know, it results in, the need to dispose of assets, I think, is questionable because, you know, a company like Nepira Castle has obviously got a very strong um, balance sheet, sufficient, you know, more than adequate liquidity. Um, and again, they, they aren't, they aren't REITs. Uh, and, and I guess, you know, what that means is that they don't have to distribute the minimum, um, you know, distribution to, to investors every sort of six months or, or every year. So there's a natural way to kind of manage your, liquidity profile and potentially, you know, reduce your debt over time um, if, if, if needs be. Um, I think the, the appetite for new, for, you know, for those companies to raise fresh equity, new equity to deploy, to expand in this environment um, coming from an SA investor base is going to be very, very challenging. Um, I think notwithstanding the fact that there's obviously limited capital available in the SA in the SA market, just given given you know what's happened with share prices and um, sort of net outflows from the, the listed property sector in South Africa, and then I think the second point is that those platforms are invested in in retail, which I think um, you know there, there's quite a healthy dose of sort of concern or or skepticism around retail in general, notwithstanding that I think everyone can acknowledge that for the right retail. Um, you know, there, there still is a, is, a, is a future, but I think the, the macro headwinds are certainly not in retail's um, favor. So um, ha- having said all of that, I think, you know, there has been sort of some expansion by South African capital into the logistics space um, in, in Poland um, over the last sort of 12 months. And I would suspect that there could potentially be other, other players, um, you know, looking or, or exploring opportunities in the logistics sector across um, Central and Eastern Eastern Europe. Can I just add, um, I'm aware of a South African family office putting together with a pension fund a significant pool of capital for PBSA in Europe. You might know about that, Craig, at the moment. So I think you're right, you have to differentiate your equity sources, but uh, some family offices who are significant in your market together with pension funds coming to Europe in the sector Samuel and I have a very big involvement. I just wanted to see whether you would agree that there is a differentiation between investor classes. Yeah, no, no, certainly, certainly. And I think, I think what you saw, you know, up until very recently, the, the investment was sort of driven into C through REIT-like structures, um, you know, listed property companies. I think what, you, what we are seeing, um, and it's not something we cover as closely, um, you know, are those private pots of capital that have got existing platforms and that, are, that either have invested in, in the region or are, you know, certainly looking to, to invest in the region. So, uh, yeah, I agree. There's been a lot of focus looking at the PwC trends report and things like that. There was a lot of focus on things like, you know, a lot of the residential size, operational real estate, um, but also things like data centers. Um, how much of an opportunity is that, or are those parts of the market just too small looking at, at both Western Europe but also CE for, for some of those opportunities? Well, I mean, that, that, that's a very good, uh, Richard, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, obviously, data centers, also other alternative uh, asset classes like life sciences. Um, you know, obviously, there is a strong interest uh, for those. Uh, actually, we are also you know, exploring opportunities in, in those sectors ourselves. And in these days, uh, if you look also at, let's say, the investment activities and you see how basically investors are looking for new asset classes, 
uh, to, to logistics, residential, but also alternatives. Uh, obviously, there is a strong demand. Um, I think, you know, obviously data centers, also life sciences, typically asset classes, which are there to grow. There will be more emphasis on those asset classes to come. I mean, one thing is sure, we are going to need more data. There will be more, you know, digital communication, et cetera. But of course, um, looking to that as an investment opportunity, I think, you know, of, of course, there are always opportunities. And what we see now is probably that the interest in those, in those sectors is, is bigger, is larger than, than the actual supply. But of course, uh, there will also be a round of analysis, consideration, looking at the context of those asset classes, looking to the operational aspects, looking at, okay, you know, how do those asset classes work? Who does operate them? How does the process work? And of course, bottom line questions, how can we make actually profit money out of those asset classes by investing in those? So I think it's, 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 uh, the interest has been, uh, I think the interest will stay. And I think in the coming years, uh, pretty quick, we see basically, we will see knowledge about those asset classes and about the operations growing. And that will also define how basically uh, investment strategies in those asset classes will be, let's say, more tailored, more defined than what we see today. But obviously fascinating to see how fast those asset classes came on the limelight. Okay, good. Richard, you had something you wanted to pick up with Douglas. Douglas, I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, residential is often ignored by the commercial property market, but as someone, you know, recently reminded, it's huge, huge, maybe the biggest um, sector. And then you have the psychological element that um, Poland, like Britain, Polish people want to buy their own house, and in Germany and Switzerland, people are more open to renting. And now, like two or three years down the line of institutional investors coming into Poland to, for residency for rent, uh, I'm just wondering if you can put us in put this into perspective. Is it working? Is it is it got big perspectives? Um, how does the psychological aspect, aspect that Polish people want to buy their own um, flat play into all of this? Well, I think firstly it's the demographic changes in demographic. If you look at the younger generations coming through, you know, and you're looking at the age group from mid twenties up to forties, there's a changing perspective in terms of value and use of their capital or use of their income. Uh, they do not see real estate in the same way as the elderly generation or the middle generation see things. Um, there's also a changing environment in the uh, city quarters where they want to have uh, a life balance, which is not all driven purely by capturing income on a property. So I think that's the first thing I would say to you, Richard, there's the changing demography and the changing aspirations of the younger um, early millennials, millennials, but also generation uh, X and Y. Can I so can I jump in? Does that worry you? No nope. demographic. No, nope. no. Nope. Okay. It's it's an advantage advantage to us. We actually see demographics as a positive because we have a concept of the living circle, where as a real estate provider, we segmentate segmentize the age dynamics. So that's why we do student accommodation, co living, and we're moving into assisted living. Sammy would know more about demography analysis than I would, but for me as a real estate person. We talk with Herman and data centers. A lot of people understand IT a little bit, but we all know we age. We all know that there's a need for us to provide the quality of services, but that is all ages of life. And this is why this living circle concept where you can provide the appropriate residential accommodation to the right age is important, but also to understand the dynamics and changing social dynamics happening in cities. And this is why I go back to my earlier comment that we're city focused not necessarily country focused. And that urban environment, that urban change is having a direct impact in the provision of residential and residential related real estate. Just give me each one key trend uh, that you think um, we're going to be looking at and discussing next year at the CE Summit. Um, let's start with you, Justina. Well, uh, for me, the future is green. <laughs> and this is also one of the key points in Berlin Hip um, philosophy. Okay, great. Thank you. Herman? <laughs> Oof, well, I was thinking about green, but I shouldn't say that anymore. Real you, can be, you can be green, that's fine. Real estate as a service, so adapting the real estate to the need of the users. Super. Samuel? In my eyes, the future of the region is also green, but in, uh, in, uh, in the colors of uh, the positive uh, trend. I think many patterns repeat in between Western and uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, 
it's already coming that it is more propensity towards uh, residential. So we expect this to happen. Okay, super. Craig? I think just a continuation of, of the trend towards um, what has traditionally been perceived as alternative sectors and, and repurposing. Okay, great. Thank you. Jean-Bernard? I'm afraid I'm looking at picking up the pieces of the epidemics that will be the topic of next year. Okay, perfect. And last but not least, Douglas? Change in dynamics in demography added to Justina's green. The two together, I think, are the important elements. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much, everybody, um, for all of your views. Thank you also for your questions. Thank you.